So one of the most gloriously beautiful mushrooms out there is also a mushroom that has a lot of contention around it. The Amanita muscaria. Edible or toxic? And most of the people are gonna say both. <laughs> but don't put that in there, but I'm letting you know if you haven't seen it. Hey, this is part two of a three-part series. If you haven't checked out part one, make sure you do so. Link down below. All right, part two, two, part two of a three-part series of when I went down to the NEMA foray 2018. I asked mushroom experts, mushroom enthusiasts, questions that are commonly asked. All right, here we are, part two. Amanita muscaria, toxic or edible? Oh. Depends how it's prepared. Mm. Edible. Yeah. That's a, Just like um, all sorts of plants that we eat that you wouldn't consider edible, but for some processing, things like rhubarb. There has to be processing for amnion muscaria. There's a method to do that. If you don't do that, it's toxic, but it's an edible mushroom. I think it's both, right? Um, I guess it all depends on how you prepare it and how comfortable you are preparing it. I mean, it's definitely not one of those, you know, cook on both sides for two minutes and you're good to go. And there's a delicate procedure that goes along with it. So um, it's all of the above, but take care. It's toxic. And some people will try to make it edible through a series of boiling or this or that. There are so many good edibles out there. You don't need to eat that. And it can be uh, very, harmful to your health, let's put it that way. So it's actually toxic for dogs and not, not toxic for humans. And so, well, it's toxic for his, uh, let, let me take, <laughs> Unpack your statement. Yeah, let, let me take several steps back there. <laughs> you know, so th there are methods that people can use to eat Amanita muscaria. You know, they parboil it, go through this elaborate process to eat it. But in, in a general sense, it, it contains, you know, a psychoactive chemical that people you know, want, to, want to consume recreationally, but it also contains other chemicals that are pretty harmful to the stomach. And so, you know, it makes you want to not you know, keep them in your belly. Right. So, you know, they're, they're definitely a toxic uh, mushroom. You. They're, they're a poisonous yeah. mushroom, but there are ways to make it edible. How can it be both? Well, you've heard a few answers that kind of describe uh, why this mushroom can be both. So, does it contain toxins? Yes, it does. If you eat the mushrooms straight up, will those toxins affect you? Yes, they will. Okay, are there ways to render that mushroom edible after appropriate processing and cooking? Yes, there are. The issue I have with just claiming that this mushroom is edible is that people like quick answers these days and tend to trust random comments on the internet a little bit too much. So for example, when I post a photo of this mushroom on my Instagram and somebody says, it's not toxic, I eat it, and someone sees that comment, that mushroom is so easy to identify. I mean, it's bright red with these beautiful white warts on top. It's depicted in fairy tales and in folklore, and it has such a rich, unique history so it's not hard for them to go and find this mushroom and they're like oh, i saw someone said that they eat it that is irresponsible irresponsible so francois is here with the latest duval miracle cheese the secret ingredient is the same magic mushroom the mushroom is edible the mushroom is toxic it is both now you need to think about some of the foods that we eat now. You go to any restaurant really, and usually they'll have like after some of the descriptions on the menu, a little asterisk. And you look down at the bottom of the menu and it says, you know, eating undercooked eggs or meat could be bad for your health or whatever it says. You know, it has that little disclaimer phrase. These are things that we're familiar with. 
We're aware of the warnings. Culturally, we eat these kinds of things all the time. Okay, so take a step away from that and enter the world of mushrooms. The world of mushrooms, let's just say in North America, we're a little fungophobic, right? Uh, there's kind of this oh, leeriness of when it comes to addressing mushrooms and fungi. Uh, so with that, we don't talk about it, we don't educate about it near as much as we do some of the other uh, flora, fauna, trees, things like that. So if other foods need to be uh, prepared and processed appropriately in order for us to be uh, consuming them safely, it makes sense there are other things like mushrooms that also need to be processed and prepared appropriately for us to consume them. Uh, the thing is, we, um, and especially in North America, don't go out and harvest mushrooms regularly. It's not something you grow up with. So that's where the, the educator in me always wants to err on the side of caution, uh, especially when it comes to talking about this online, uh, where I'm not having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody. Um, but yeah, there are mushrooms out there that if you process them appropriately, and by this, I don't mean you just cook it extra long on the frying pan. No, there's an actual process you have to go through for different mushrooms in order to make them edible. Okay, so you understand that. Um, Amanita muscaria isn't the only one, it's just the one that gets questions a lot. And side note, yes, it is also psychoactive. The toxins that are within it are psychoactive, so it's both toxic, psychoactive, and edible all at the same time. The idea of foraging in general has gained a lot of popularity recently. Uh, homesteading practices, uh, collecting wild edibles, um, it's just something that people are starting to look to uh, and trying to kind of reconnect with their roots. And so the question was posed, do I feel like there are too many people out there foraging for mushrooms now and is it a concern with teaching people more about harvesting mushrooms that too many people are going to be out doing this so i asked that question to these guys no no there's not too many people there needs to be more people i wish everyone were out there foraging i wish donald trump had a visceral connection to uh you know the outdoors and the, the natural ecosystem and, and, and everyone in this country and you know if, if that were the case there would be a lot more um demand i think for preserving wild habitats awesome biodiversity i like that i mean at least in the pacific northwest there is a lot of potential mushroom territory. The fact that it's growing popularity, I think the benefits, at least for now, outweigh the negatives in that there's more knowledge and there's more um, advocates for keeping like old growth in place and all that stuff. So, so far so good. Certainly not in Kentucky. There's hardly anybody out. <laughs> you hear that, Kentucky? <laughs> yes. I don't think it's a problem with amateurs foraging. I think um, commercial foragers that forage in the wild can be destructive of the environment if they're not careful. Mm -hmm. But I'm all for amateurs getting out and getting to know mushrooms and the rest of nature too. Because if there aren't any mushrooms out, you get to learn about birds and um, natural plants and that kind of thing. So it's a great way to get some exercise. I was pleasantly surprised with the optimism that a lot of folks had in addressing this question. And I realized a connection. Uh, these people who are part of NEMA, North America Mycological Association, uh, they're people who have seen the positive results of having more people involved and out in the woods foraging. Because a lot of times people who take the step to also connect with a mycological association or a mushroom club, they become really good stewards of the land. They become people who are involved in the citizen science side of things. And there are people who uh, want to actually do things well. And so I see from the answers that people gave that they saw enough, enough people gaining interest in the world of mushrooms and fungi that they are seeing beautiful things come out of it. Any kind of knowledge is a double-edged sword and the opposite side of that sword is people go through tromping through the woods and disrespecting nature and uh, digging up specimens that they're not going to use. Um, 
getting into land that they're not supposed to be on, uh, a lot of disrespect in those regards. And yeah, that's always a possibility. And I think that's why it's important for those of us who have good foraging practices uh, and uh, taking care of the, the natural resources that we have that we continue to be good examples and kind of call people out if they're not. On that note, I am absolutely going to be putting together some videos that talk about these certain topics. Best harvesting practices, how to be a good steward of the land, and uh, citizen science stuff. We're going to have videos on that and get deep into that kind of world. So look forward to those in the future. Since I brought up the topic of being a citizen scientist uh, and uh, wanting to be involved in that way, a great question I got asked was, as someone who doesn't come from academia and is an everyday mushroom forager, how can I get involved in those things? Do I need to go back to school and get a degree in order to participate in research? And really, what is the best way for me to get plugged in to already established um, projects that are going on in the mycological world? Um, I mean, I think it's always a great idea as a first step is to join your local club because via the club you can meet other mushroom lovers. And that includes like professional mycologists who can connect you with, with grander schemes. I mean, or even going to like conferences like NAMA where you're sometimes accidentally involved in scientific research because they're tracking and documenting all the all the finds. You don't need a degree, you just need a passion. Go out in the woods, you look at mushrooms, you hang out with people who have more knowledge than you because that's an easy way to learn and these days it's so easy on the internet too and um, just, you know, don't eat anything you don't know what it is. <laughs> oh, so easy. Just get out in the woods and pick mushrooms, learn all you can. You're just going to go down so many rabbit holes. I'm using the army of citizen scientists all the time in networking on Facebook just by um, asking for collections of the specimens I study um, and the word gets around the network is robust join a local mushroom club join the North American Mycological Association come to one of our forays get involved in the North American Mycophora project there's lots of ways to do it and if you can find a mentor in your area that will take you out and teach you that's the way to really boost your learning I really appreciated the answers that these folks gave because even though some of them seem super simple, like join a mycological society, <laughs> that is such a great tip because within a mycological society, you may have the most in-depth, knowledgeable folks that you ever would run across and you realize they're totally down to earth. That person you maybe were like sitting with at lunch, you all of a sudden realize has described and named over a hundred species of fungi. You never know because they're just there hanging out like everyone else, wanting to spread more awareness and have fun with mushrooms. And they're so willing to connect with people who are also involved in that. So if you're looking for like a mentor or somebody just to help you figure out how to start being involved in a research project, do that. And then a couple of the other answers hit on a few things. And I would highly encourage you to look into iNaturalist, Mushroom Observer, and the North America Mycoflora Project, which I have a button for right here. I will again probably be doing a full video more on the citizen science side of things because it's something I'm excited about and I think everybody can really get involved in. But that's all I have to say about that for now. What about the mushroom spores? Some mushrooms produce billions and billions of spores. Uh, am I going to be in trouble if I have a bunch of mushrooms in my car and they're releasing spores or I'm sniffing mushrooms? Ooh, what's going to happen? All right, so here are some answers to that question. I'm not concerned personally, and as far as I know, I would say pretty definitively that the spores of toxic mushrooms won't hurt you because they're toxic. But if you work at like a mushroom farm, the spores of mushrooms are tiny microparticles that can bother your lungs, but not because of the toxicity of them. Right. I would say definitely not. I think it's actually a good thing if you're kind of littered with spores sometimes because then if you're walking in the woods then you're kind of inoculating things even if you don't know it. So I say spore up. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> awesome. I don't think it's a big problem. 
you shouldn't be sniffing a lot of spores just because it's not great for your lungs to be sniffing anything that's like dust or whatever. You don't want that in your lungs. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a disease called lycoperdonosis, I think, and so it's a, it, it it can actually infect humans, um, and it, it's a disease that's related to inhalation of spores. But the only cases that have been reported in humans are from teenagers, oh usually males, <laughs> who take puffballs and will inhale the spores, you know, trying to do whatever it is teenagers do, and they come up with a respiratory disease. Awesome. But so, like a bird on is, is, is more common in dogs, so it's easier okay. for a dog, you know, the dog goes and puts his nose in a puffball and it's much easier for them to get that disease. But it's, it's a known disease within humans as well. There's also diseases about, so people that work at mushroom farms, um, harvesting oyster mushrooms. Oysters, mm. they're notorious for having really high spore mm. levels. And so unless you're in an environment like that or you're a silly teenager, the odds of, you know, getting a disease from spores is very small. Overall, we see that the average mushroom forager doesn't really have to worry about spore release. But if you're a cultivator or someone who is uh, in really tight quarters with mushrooms that are constantly releasing their spores, you should be very cautious. Uh, maybe wear a mask. Uh, something to protect yourself. I'd like to add if you have, you know, chronic illness that has to do with your respiratory system or asthma, just be a little more on the cautious side as well. But as far as smelling your mushrooms or having a basket of mushrooms in your vehicle, you should be good to go. There is one thing, and I believe it is called cryptococcus, and it is actually something that is in the Pacific Northwest where I live, and it's an underground uh, fungi and it produces a lot of spores and it has been causing some major illnesses in folks. The theory on this is is that the soil temperatures are rising and that is why this fungus is starting to produce more spores. Whereas it was perfectly happy and a mycelial state before and why we didn't have to worry about it. I should have read the article before I made this video, but maybe I will find a good article and put a link in the comments for you guys, because it's something noteworthy where spores can actually be dangerous for you. Thanks for watching part two of our Name of Foray question series. All right, make sure you get that bell on so that when part three drops, you'll be ready for it. All right, like, comment, subscribe. Thanks for watching, guys.